Evolution is an accordion term. This one word can mean anything from mere change over time to universal common descent, where all life descends from a common ancestor, to what I call the Darwinian model. The Darwinian model is basically universal common descent brought about by natural processes, none of which requires design as an explanation. When a proponent of the Darwinian model says that evolution is an empirically proven fact, that individual is usually referring to change over time. Indeed, change over time is a proven fact. However, when creationist groups deny evolution, they are not denying change over time. Usually, they are denying one or both of the latter definitions. In other words, the evolution that the creationist groups deny is not the same evolution which is considered a scientifically proven fact. To say so would be an equivocation fallacy. Theistic evolution is the view that God providentially arranged the universe to unfold in such a way that life would evolve from a single-celled organism into an organism or a series of organisms that would suit his purposes. It is an attempt to harmonize science with scripture. Theistic evolution lets God retain some of his role in the development of life, but hides his work so thoroughly that there is no way of telling which features of life are the result of natural processes and which are the result of direct divine intervention. The question is, which model of origins is right? Is the Darwinian model of evolution, be it naturalistic or theistic, or is Behean evolution correct, or is some sort of creationist model correct? What issues can we bring up to compare the differing views? One issue with coming up with a naturalistic origin of life is the issue of time. We live in a solar system with a yellow star. The thing about yellow stars, such as our own, is that they only last about 10 billion years before exploding into a red giant and obliterating what's around them. Our sun is about halfway through its main sequence at about 5 billion years old. This gives evolution a time limit. Nature does not have unlimited time to produce life and evolve it into advanced beings. And if the forces of nature cannot produce advanced life within 10 billion years, then naturalistic evolution is untenable. John Barrow and Frank Tipler have listed in their book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, 10 steps in the evolution of Homo sapiens. Each step is so improbable that it would take the forces of nature over 10 billion years to produce any one of these 10 steps. 1. The development of DNA-based genetic code. 2. The invention of aerobic respiration. 3. The invention of glucose fermentation to pyruvic acid. 4. The origin of autotropic photosynthesis. 5. The origin of mitochondria. 6. The formation of the centriole kinetosome, uh, undula, whatever, this, this thing. 7. The evolution of an eye precursor. 8. The development of an endoskeleton. 9. The development of chordates. And 10. The evolution of Homo sapiens in the chordate lineage. As you can see, evolution requires just as much supernatural intervention as the various creationist models. Therefore, Darwinian evolution offers no advantage over creationist models in lessening the need for divine intervention. But now the question is, with the naturalistic advantage lost, is the Darwinian model the best explanation? Well, let's look at its rivals. For the first, Behean evolution. This model is sometimes called intelligent design. People sometimes ask me, couldn't God have used evolution as his tool for creating life? That's pretty much Michael Behe's view. Behe and Evolution is the model advanced by Michael Behe in his book Darwin's Black Box and the Edge of Evolution. Michael Behe believes in universal common descent, that all life evolved from a single common ancestor. The difference between Behe and Evolution and the standard theistic evolution is that Behe believes that science can discover which features of life evolved naturally and which features were deliberately evolved by God. Another model is progressive creation. This is the view held by reasons to believe and the one I hold. Progressive creation acknowledges that random mutation, natural selection, and other natural processes do play a role in how species change over time. The main difference between progressive creation and Behean evolution is that progressive creation denies universal common descent. Instead, some species, and the percentage can vary depending on the progressive creation model, some species at least were created in the form that we see in the fossil record. They did not evolve from a single celled life form. Are there any criteria we can use to evaluate these models? Well, first, one issue I have with Behe and evolution is that it requires too many miracles. Take a class of mammals, for example. There is only so much the designer can do to change a single generation. Change too much, and the young will not be able to live inside the mother's womb, or to nurse, or to interact with the rest of the animals. The biology will be too different. Next, the fossil record is hard to reconcile with theistic evolution. Stephen Jay Gould advanced his idea of punctuated equilibrium to explain the saltation-heavy nature of the fossil record. 
Instead of digging up relatively smooth continuum of transitional fossils, paleontologists tend to dig up large quantities of one species, like species A, and then large quantities of another species, species B. Then they tend to find these fragmented skeletons of perhaps a third species, which they then assume, oh, this must be an evolutionary link. In other words, Gould was trying to explain in naturalistic terms just why the fossil record looks exactly the way progressive creation predicts it will look. Well, how about the theological implications? Well, the first problem with theistic evolution is that it is difficult to square with the account in Genesis. Even if theistic evolution can explain the origin of Adam, it cannot explain the origin of Eve. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man, and when he slept, took one of the ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. The theistic evolutionist can, of course, allegorize the passage away. The problem is that using the allegory brush to explain away passages you do not like is a way of making the Bible say whatever you want. The text becomes like putty in your hands that you can fashion to your heart's desire. Another key difference between theistic evolution and biblical monotheism is that the former accepts the Darwinian view of human ancestry. According to modern evolutionary biology, the group that evolved from hominids to modern humans over a few million years ago always contained at least a thousand members at any given time. As a result, modern evolutionary biology is incompatible with the existence of a unique historical Adam and Eve. Theistic evolution, if it is to be compatible with modern evolutionary biology, cannot hold to a historical Adam and historical Eve as the progenitors of the entire human race. How then on theistic evolution do we avoid the Pelagian heresy? Pelagius was charged with believing that Adam only set a bad example, but his sin did not damage human nature. Humanity was, on Pelagianism, as mortal before the fall as it was after the fall. On Pelagianism, Jesus also set a good example, but he did not change human nature either. So what's wrong with Pelagianism? It may surprise you to realize that there's nothing unbiblical about Pelagius' view of the human will. The Eastern Orthodox Church has held firmly that sin is not something you are born with, but something you do. In Deuteronomy 30.15, God gives an offer to Israel that it can choose the good or choose the evil. The idea that original sin made humanity unable to freely choose God is foreign to ancient Israel, foreign to ancient Judaism, and foreign to modern Judaism, as well as the Eastern Orthodox Church. I do not believe that the New Testament teaches it. Instead, the problem with Pelagius is that he believed that Adam and Eve were created mortal. The Bible teaches consistently that Adam and Eve were created immortal, and it was only after their sin that they became mortal. Paul summarizes this quite well in his letter to the Corinthians. But in fact, Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all shall be made alive. Death here cannot merely mean spiritual death, because its parallel is resurrection. And resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the physical resurrection of the body. Instead, Paul is affirming that humanity did not become mortal until Adam and Eve sinned. On theistic evolution, however, humanity emerged gradually as mortal hominids slowly evolved into mortal homo sapiens, which is inconsistent with Paul's theology. Paul continues to emphasize the unique role of Adam. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man Jesus, the Messiah, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace in the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus, the Messiah. Theologians have tried to weaken the analogy and parallel of Adam and Jesus in order to avoid belief in a unique historical Adam. Such interpretations are extremely forced. Does it look like Paul is comparing a historical figure to a mythical one? Does it look like Paul is comparing an allegorical fall to a literal redemption? Instead, theistic evolutionists, when they address Romans 5, 
tend to think of this doctrine as describing the gradual emergence of a moral awareness. This is very difficult, if not impossible, to reconcile with Paul's anthropology. Theistic evolutionists like Danis Lamoureux are forced to assert that the events in Genesis 3 never really happened. Instead, Lamoureux believes that Paul was using ancient ideas of origins to make a theological point. Other theistic evolutionists try to harmonize Genesis 3 by saying that Adam and Eve were ancient farmers, selected by God to follow his ways. The problem is that this does nothing to explain Paul's teaching that Adam is the progenitor of the entire human race. If Adam is not the unique ancestor of all of humanity, Paul's argument breaks down. And it's for these reasons and more that I find theistic evolution to be theologically unacceptable. The most important apologetics task in the 21st century, not just for Christians but for theists in general, will be to overthrow Darwinian anthropology, because this anthropology infects almost every discipline related to our worldview. The view of humanity as evolved primates does tremendous damage to the Imago Dei, the image of God. It forces almost a Pelagian view of Adam's fall. It damages our view of free will, painting us as instinct-driven animals. It helps to deny personal responsibility for criminal actions, and it infects our view of all sorts of other disciplines, such as language, medicine, philosophy, psychology, sociology, religion, law, government, and education. Darwinian anthropology has got to go. Shalom. Aleichem.